everyone, ministry that's here, laity, everyone, the Lord loves us all. And we're so grateful that you've taken your time to come out and to hear tonight. We pray again that it will be a blessing to you. Today we'll be talking about accessing the power of God for healing and deliverance. We know that we hear often about God moving and God being able to touch the lives of people, that God setting the captives free. But often we strive within ourselves to see it manifest in our own lives. This should not be with the Christian. We should be a living, walking demonstration of who Jesus Christ is. We are the body of Christ. And so we're going to, today, for those who don't know, we're going to find out how to access that power that the Lord has promised us. So I'm going to read the lesson. Throughout the world, men and women are in captivity imprisoned by sickness, demonic oppression that manifests in a variety of ways, addictions, etc. Some are blinded to the fact they are, that they are in prison while others are desirous to be delivered, yet they cannot on their own. We often tell them of what our God can do, yet they see no evidence of these great things. They're looking for a deliverer. It is you that they're seeking, beloved. The Holy Spirit-filled Christian that is in a spiritual position to allow back or be reconnected, the first reconnective surgery, then surely he's the same God today. He's the same God in your life. The same Holy Spirit is within you. That same Holy Spirit that came upon Jesus and anointed him. Not only is he coming upon you now, he's saying, you know what? I'm not just going to have to come when you call. I'm just going to stay here. Because the need may arise at any time. 
And because the need may arise, I don't want you to have to get into a prayer room to call me to do something. I'm going to be right there so that you, when you call, I can just rise up and move. Your belly is the place I want to pour through because out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Living waters bring life where sin brought death. This is truth. The application of truth sets you free. Some of you are called to do great things. I want to be honest with you. I'm doing what I'm called to do. This is what I was told to do. To teach the people this very stuff. He gave me lessons to do this in books and things like that. Myself and my wife and we send them around the world. And people are hearing and reading these things. Many have never saw me before. This is their first time. But it's not about me at all. It's about him. And his people, which you are. Let's go on. It is here that most Christians miss it. For they declare that they do not or they don't do many things that are sin. Did I ask how many sins make us unrighteous? Or how serious must a sin be to make us unrighteous? Does it take murder? Does it take rape or fornication, adultery, abortion, cursing God, homosexuality? Etc. to make us unrighteous? Or can the basic things like complaining, yeah. murmuring, yeah. little truths, or white lies, I'm not home. Just tell them I'm not home. <laughs> then you go in your prayer closet and expect God to hear you. I mean, this is true though. Does that cause God to grieve? Lusting, entertaining sinful thoughts without engaging in them physically. Watching unclean things on television, using the Lord's name in vain. This is a big one in our hour. We even paraphrased it, um, O-M-G. Is that using the Lord's name in vain? Yes. What does the scripture say? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He will not hold them guiltless who do. When I hear Christ, I mean, I hear Christians all the time. Oh my, Jesus Christ! Excuse me, Lord. I'm just using this as a Jesus Christ. All I hear Christians. I'm like, wait a minute. If you don't know better, how are they going to not know better? Amen. In the pulpits, there's a revival coming. I'm declaring to you today. There's a revival coming. What you're hearing today is part of what God is doing in this last hour. It is not a revival where in which men shall be great. It's a revival where the body of Christ will be put in right standing Amen. with their God. Amen. And their God will do displays through them that they could not ever imagine. Because they do no longer or no longer impede him from moving. Let's go on. unjustified anger, disobedience to God in any way, not loving those who love us the wrong way, saying and any bad thing about other people, backbiting or talking behind someone's back, gossiping, pride, vainglory, wanting to be honored and adored through position, rank, title of things we have, even in the church, we have a lesson called mistitled to be in time. Part one and part two, that is that so many people take on the biggest title they can get so that they can have entitlements and be honored. Never put on what God did not give you. You work best where he calls you, not where men honor. Let's go on. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with calls, but make sure that you're the one called to that. Don't let somebody come and put something on you. Listen, I see you as this. Maybe so, but God didn't tell me now was the time. Because with a new level, New devil. Oh, you want to jump up in the official or officer's stratosphere? Well, guess what? Those little earth demons are not up here. You got a couple of principalities you want to deal with. Right. Let's go on. Idolatry, personal idolatry, and idolatry of others. We're living in that time. It's not just the big sins that are stopping the church of the living God from accessing his power. It is the little foxes that are spoiling the vine or stopping God's life-giving power from flowing through us. This is the issue. 
We're having all night shut-ins and asking God to pour out his spirit. And he's saying, why don't you just remove the things that stop me from moving? Amen. Song of Solomon 2.15 says, take us the foxes, the little foxes, the spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. It's the small things that the enemy trips us up with. And we're going to need to have to take a look at that and adjust them and say, God, you know what? It's me, God, that's standing in the need. I want to fix this, and I want to be where you've called me to be. We must begin to address the little sins that the enemy is using to steal the anointing in our lives. Again, it was because of the anointing that Jesus had power to do all of the things in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. His house to get his things. And righteousness is the key to get in his house. Let's go on. This causes Mark 16, 17 through 18 to happen, which says... And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There is a last day's move of God beginning to happen right this moment. Right where you are. Right where you are. I declare to you that God is doing something right now. He's stirring up some things. And some of you, you're saying... That's me, Lord. I know that this has been the hindrance. This is the missing piece, God, to the equation. Mm. Right here. Yet it will be founded on righteousness, and it will soon enable those who are in right standing with power. God's end time work will be one of righteousness. I don't know if you realize that. It's in the word. That the last move would be a move of faith. Not only faith. Would it be a move of love? Would it be a denominational move? Let's read about it. Romans 9, 28 says, For he will finish the work <laughs> and cut it short in. So the last day's work is one of righteousness. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. We have been in denial far, far too long, expecting God to fulfill his part of the anointing us while not fulfilling our part of striving to truly live holy and staying in right standing with him through the repentance turning away of sins. We've asked him to do something based on a contract, but we will not honor our part. It's time to change, is it not? There is no secret path or, to or remedy to accessing the anointing. It's just being willing to be humble or humble ourselves and saying, it's me, Lord, in need. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have found out that when I deal with me, I can better deal with others. Many people are having issues on their job, in their homes, in their families because they have not let God deal with them. You have not allowed God to see you. We're always pointing, they're the one, they're the one, they're the one. They're doing this, God. They're, and God is saying, what about you? It's time for us to take a true self-evaluation and humble ourselves and put down our pride and say, it's not me. Stop saying it's not me and say, you know what, God? It's I. It's me that stands in the need right now. I'm here. There are days where I have up days and I know the enemy is constantly trying to trip me up. And sometimes I fall. I trip. It may not be anything major, but it's enough to stop the anointing. And so I get up and I wipe off my knees. I confess my sins and I don't hide behind fig leaves like Adam and Eve did. I come boldly before the throne because I know the Lamb of God has already shed his precious blood for me. And I ask him to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I know at that particular point there has been restoration, reconciliation. I'm now able to come before the throne boldly, again accessing the power of God. Whether it be the anointing to teach, whether it be the anointing to exhort, whether it be healing that God needs me to do at that time. I now have access to God's chambers of treasures. 